Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwell. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Stocks drop and the dollar rallies after Fed hawks were at a Mester and James Bullard signal support for steeper rate hikes. We also hear from Isabel Schnabel of the ECB. China's top tech banker, Bao Fang, goes missing, fueling speculation of renewed government clampdown on the finance industry, and NatWest shares plunge as a British bank posts higher costs and misses profit estimates, but announces bigger than expected share buyback. Now, first thing is first, let's check in on the markets. There's a lot going on. First of all, there's definitely a tilt to more hawkish messaging, messaging from central banks, not only uh, to very uh, hawkish, but influential non-voting members of the Fed came out yesterday saying watch out the markets may be not pricing this correctly but we also heard from Isabel Schnabel of the ECB, Ariana Rando and our Alexander Weber did a great interview in Frankfurt earlier this morning and one of the most senior officials of the ECB, Isabel Schnabel, is basically saying look we're still far away from claiming victory and she specifically pointed to the fact that the markets could also be getting it wrong. European stocks on the back of all of that down 1%. If you look at Europe U.S. futures are also seeing a bit of pressure. And then we look at dollar and, of course, sterling. We also know that uh, Rishi Sunak, the prime minister of the U.K., is in Northern Ireland trying to broker a deal, of course, on the Northern Ireland protocol. So let's look at some of the European maps. Now, one of the big differences between a CAC 40 and, for example, uh, a U.K., of course, they both will get inflation. We're also expecting the bulk de France governor to speak a bit later today. But there's a difference in earnings stories. So we have NatWest down 7% today because of forward guidance. They beat on all metrics for the last quarter, but it's really the forward guidance in terms of costs that they're worried about. Here in France, we have a luxury maker, Hermès, continuing uh, to benefit from price points that seem to be oblivious to the cost of living crisis and also managing to sidestep uh, the slow reopening in China in the last couple of quarters. Now, two top Fed officials, as we were saying, opening the door to an upshift in rate hikes as U.S. economic data signals the fight against inflation is far from won. St. Louis Fed President James Bullard, Cleveland's Loretta Mester have both made the case for a bigger hike next month. But this juncture, the incoming data have not changed my view that we will need to bring the Fed funds rate above 5% and hold it there for some time. Indeed, at our meeting two weeks ago, setting aside what financial market particip participants expected us to do, I saw a compelling economic case for a 50 basis point increase, which would have brought the top of the target range to 5%. I think we can lock in this disinflationary trend by continuing to have policy rate increases during 2023, even though the real economy looks like it's going to uh, continue to grow and the labor market uh, broadly across the country looks like it remains strong. Well, one of the European Central Bank's most senior officials say investors risk underestimating the persistence of inflation and the response needed to bring it under control. Speaking to Bloomberg, ECB executive board member Isabel Schnabel says markets are priced for perfection. There's a risk that inflation proves to be more persistent than expected. Well, joining us now is Richard Saldana, Portfolio Manager of Global Equity Income at Aviva Investors. Richard, thank you for joining us. When you look at the very hawkish messaging from already two hawks from the Fed, but also from Isabel Schnabel of the ECB, is the market just mispricing how aggressive these central banks have to be? And good morning. Hey, good morning, Francine. Yeah, I think you're right there. I mean, when, certainly when you look at the, the at PPI number that we had this week, I mean, you know, that was a real warning sign that, you know, the fight against inflation is is far from over. And we, obviously, we've seen 10-year yields push higher of late. And I'll argue, yes, there's still some element of complacency, particularly in that in that expectation of sort of rate cuts that, that you know, certainly when we look at the, the rate curves the market has this year, it certainly feels like restrictive policy may need to be in place for a lot longer. Certainly when you look at the core elements of inflation, they're proving rather sticky at the moment. So particularly on the labor side, we're still seeing tight supply chains globally right now. So yes, I'd argue certainly elements of complacency right now. So what does that mean for your, for your investment strategy right now, Richard? 
Yeah, look, when we think about, you know, what we've seen here today, look, it's been an extraordinary rally, particularly in the sort of more cyclical parts of the market. So, again, you think about, you know, some of the consumer discretionary names, industrial names, risk appetite has increased, you know, with, you know certainly the hopes of a of softer landing have increased as well. And look, whilst that's understandable, you know, when we think about signs that inflation may have peaked, you know, it's certainly proving rather sticky, but, you know, falling gas prices, which has helped certainly from a European perspective, China reopening as well. So certainly signs why that risk appetite should have increased. But certainly when we look at the rally and what we've seen so far this year, I think there's signs that, you know, we may be getting a bit stretched here right now. What's your main takeaway from earnings season? I know, you know, a lot of companies, certainly industry groups have done better than expected. Is there a worry that this is just a delaying effect for a lot of pain to come? Yeah, look, I'd, I'd say it's been a mixed results season. Um, look, companies are reported results probably not as bad as feared. But, you know, when we look at particularly the demand side of the equation, you're certainly starting to see signs of, you know, consumers continuing to be squeezed. Pricing has certainly remained, you know, pretty robust. But we think that's going to come under pressure, particularly as we think, you know, as we go through this year, if that demand environment continues to, to weaken further. The U.S. consumer has held up well. I mean, that's certainly been, you know, that's certainly helped. But, you know, we've seen that pool of excess savings, which was a big driver of that last year, continue to be drawn down. So, you know, we look at the savings rate coming down there, signs that the consumer is, 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 starting, to, is starting to weaken there. So, you know, we, we think that that's really, you know, where, where investors need, need to be looking at right now. You know, and, and we think, you know, certainly when we think about it from an opportunity standpoint, we actually think the more defensive parts of the market is really where people need to be looking at right now. So healthcare to us remains a standout in terms of opportunity right now. So we're thinking about the health insurance sector, names such as United Health, Elevance, you think the value that these companies are operate, offering you right now, and actually a pretty high degree of earnings visibility. So, you know, we think about the challenges that we're facing right now. You've got companies here in, in, in that sector that are, that are giving you that earnings visibility and actually, you know, have derated relative to the market. So we think that's where the value is right now. It's in the more defensive parts rather than the more cyclical parts of the market. So what does that mean? I mean, last year was all about falling valuations. Is this year, are we going to see a rally in certain parts or are we, is it, how bumpy is it going to be? I think it's going to continue to remain quite bumpy, if we're honest. You know, as I said, you know, when you look at, you know, the results season we've had, it's pretty mixed. Certainly companies, I'd say, have been quite conservative in terms of their guidance. I, I think that reflects, you know, you know, they don't really have that visibility when you think of the, you know, in the second second half of this year. So, we think those challenges still remain. I mean, as I said, you know, pricing, you know, has has certainly helped. There's certainly been elements of the market where pricing remains strong. So, you think about the consumer staples names that we've seen right now, particularly in the U.S., the likes of Pepsi, Coke, P and G, etc. But you know, we're certainly seeing in Europe even some of those staples names that are pushing through pricing. I think of the likes of Nestle. Unilever are seeing that element of, you know, the consumer's not able to take some of that pricing. But you're seeing that in, the, in terms of the volume weakness, some elements of mm -hmm. trading down there. So, as I said, that pricing lever, which has certainly helped offset some of the demand weakness, we think is also going to come under pressure as we, as, as we go through this year. Um, Richard, how do you look at the difference, for example, between Europe and the U.S., also given what central banks are doing? Are you tactically allocating to certain countries or regions? Yeah, look, we think from a valuation standpoint, Europe still remains pretty attractive right now. Um, you know, we're certainly looking at particularly some of the companies on the luxury side of things. So, you know, the, the likes of, you know, Caring, Richemont, et cetera, LVMH. You know, we, we know, again, when we think about what's going on in China right now and that sort of reopening story, that Chinese consumer coming back, that pent up demand, I think that continues to sort of, you know, continues to play out. And we think, you know, this year that will continue to be the case as well. So I think that's one element. And actually, if you think about Europe as well, some of the, some of the more industrial names, you know, particularly on the automation side of things, we actually think whilst, you know, companies have been prioritizing, obviously, from a cost base, we think automation continues to be one element where they, where they certainly, you know, are prioritizing spending right now. So you saw that in the results from Schneider this week, Siemens the week before. So we think, again, that automation piece is probably one area that will continue to hold up quite well and be quite resilient. Richard, thank you so much, as ever, for all of your insights. Richard Saldana, their portfolio manager of global equity income at Aviva Investors. Now, coming up, China's top tech banker has gone missing, brewing concerns over a fresh clampdown by the Chinese government. We have all of the details next, and this is Blooper. What we're trying to do with products around the world is uh, very much like other luxury companies do, is ensure that you have 
somehow level pricing around the world so that equivalent products have roughly the same price uh, levels uh, in the main markets. Uh, that's what we did with two models in China. Uh, last year, our battery electrical sales grew by just shy of 70%. Uh, this year, uh, we will be in a position to double our sales of battery electric vehicles. So uh, the future direction going electric uh, is set and we're executing on it. That was the chief executive officer of Mercedes, Ola Kalinas, speaking to Bloomberg a bit earlier. Now, Mercedes, Mercedes, I don't know why I'm mispronouncing, is trading higher on the back of these results. Now, NatWest shares sliding this morning after it said costs would be actually higher this year. It also gave guidance that disappointed some investors. The bank did announce a fresh share buyback and a more than doubling of operating profit before tax. Now, the chief executive officer, Alison Rose, says the British economy is still having a tough time. People are facing real challenges with the squeeze of the cost of living, with higher interest rates, with higher inflation. In the UK, one in four people have less than £100 in savings, and that, that means their financial resilience when you do get hits, as, as we have in the economy, are tough. Meanwhile, China's top tech banker, Bao Fang, is missing, leading to speculation of another clampdown by the government. The investment bank he leads, China Renaissance, says they can't reach him. Now, the bank's shares slumped as much as 50% in Hong Kong today. Joining us to discuss all of this is Tom Metcalf, who leads REMEA Banking Coverage. So, Tom, good morning again. What do we know about this banker in China? Yeah, not much more than you've, you've just said. So the company's come out and said they haven't been able to get in contact with him for a couple of days. And, and we understand his family's been told he's helping or involved in an investigation uh, by uh, authorities. So to be honest, it's again this sort of information vacuum that comes around when you know these things like this happen in China. And if you look at that share price, that 50% fall, it's, given a, it's gained back a bit more. So that's down about 28, 30%. Um, but it just goes to show these big, very difficult to sort of couch for risks um, that still remain in China. So switching to Bank of America, what's the latest on the proposed job cuts? Yeah, Bank of America are kind of joining uh, sort of uh, or getting in line with other banks who have already cut jobs in investment banking. So for a long time, Bank of America was saying that we're going to slow down hiring, we're going to freeze hiring, we don't need to make cuts. Uh, now they're making a sort of limited number of cuts. We think about 200 perhaps across all of investment banking globally. And I think it just goes to show, hey, 2023 is going to be a tough year if you're an investment banker deal maker. 2022 wasn't great. And it doesn't look like that pipeline of deals is, is going to free up anytime soon. What were your key takeaways from that West earnings, Tom? Well, I nearly had a heart attack when the shares went down because I was uh, reading them thinking, no, this, these are okay set of earnings. But no, the um, market really took against that guidance uh, from the bank. Basically, not that it was particularly bad, it was just I think the market wanted more. So they said net interest margin is going to stay roughly the same at 3.2%. And the shares, um, you know, have been on an upward swing this year. And I think the market's going to be taking quite a lot of that back today. Tom, thank you so much. Uh, Tom Metcalf there with the very latest on a number of banking stories. Coming up, the UK Prime Minister heads to Northern Ireland for talks as Brexit negotiations near a deal in Brussels. So we'll have plenty more on that story next. And this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Francine Lacqua here in London. Let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Francine. Joe Biden says he plans to speak with President Xi Jinping over the downing of an alleged Chinese spy balloon. The U.S. president says intelligence agencies don't have evidence that three other objects shot down were surveillance craft. Biden says the U.S. wants competition with China, not a new Cold War. Now, China's top leaders say the country has achieved a decisive victory over COVID. State television reports a Politburo Standing Committee is saying Beijing's policy U-turn late last year 
has been totally right. According to China's official figures, just 102 deaths were recorded on Monday. Credit card balances in the U.S. hit a record in the final quarter of last year as robust consumer spending collided with rising prices. According to data from the New York Fed, Americans had $986 billion on their cards, which was the biggest quarterly increase in data going back to 1999. Late payments is also surpassing pre-pandemic norms, with more than 4% of credit card debt described as in serious delinquency. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans, and this is Bloomberg Francie. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is in Belfast for talks with Northern Ireland parties today. It comes as expectations mount that the UK and the EU are actually close to reaching a deal on post-Brexit trading arrangements. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Joe Mays. Joe, we think we're nearing a Brexit deal. How soon could it come? Well, it sounds like it could come perhaps Tuesday next week. That's the expectation. Rishi Sunak will have these meetings in Northern Ireland. He'll have these meetings potentially with uh, Sir von der Leyen in Munich on Saturday, which would be the high-level political talks, which could get us over the line. And then the expectation is that Rishi Sunak could go to his cabinet on Tuesday to brief them and then present a paper in Parliament with, with, with the deal. So, yeah, it sounds like we could be you know, very much at the end game. It's Brexit all over again. <laughs> There you go. As far as we understand, Joe, so Rishi Sunak's Belfast trip is to begin an engagement process. Is he going to promise things? Do you know what they'll discuss in detail? We don't know the full details, but I imagine he'll be looking to reassure the parties in Northern Ireland that the negotiation that he's done with the EU has achieved what they want to see. You recognise the likes of the Democratic Unionist Party. They've been boycotting the executive in Northern Ireland over the situation with the protocol. So Rishi Sunak will be looking to convince them that, yes, this deal does perhaps reduce some of the trade frictions that the DUP are very concerned about. It perhaps rolls back some of the influence of the EU over Northern Ireland, but that, that's really to be seen. It will, it will really go down to the details, especially over things like the role of the European Court of Justice. So, yeah, lots lots to lots to look at in those details, which could be make or break whether this achieves what Sunak yeah. wants to do. So, Joe, I mean, the other thing is that Tory Brexiteers have definitely indicated that they would oppose any agreement that would allow the European Court of Justice to maintain jurisdiction on matters of EU law in Northern Ireland. Are we, like, you know, if you look at all the constituents and all the stakeholders in this, who's going to likely block this more? Well, I think the key thing that goes in Richard Schenck's favour is that those hardliners, so to speak, those purists on the Brexit question within the Conservative Party, their number is fairly few at this point, such that Rishi Sunak probably could afford to have a decent amount of dissent from that group. But he'd still be able to get any kind of deal past Parliament because he's enough of, of, of his own kind of backers in the Conservative Party, plus even Labour might be supportive as well. So I think Rishi's, Rishi's bet here is that, you know, the, the hard right might not like it, but it doesn't matter. Like, he thinks he, he'll, he'll still be able to get this through. And, and will that help with the economy? Joe, can you give us a sense of exactly, you know, where the agreement will fall on? Well, if it does reduce some of the trade barriers between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK, that might perhaps give a boost to trade to Northern Ireland. But Northern Ireland has been one of the more successful performing regions of the UK in recent times, perhaps because of that location it has both in the EU single market and in the UK's internal market. So that, that, that will be some benefit. And also this would probably reduce significantly the prospect of a trade war with the European Union, which had been a kind of slightly distant prospect, but a prospect nevertheless, because of these ongoing rumbling uh, tensions over the online protocol. So that would be an upside as well. Joe, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Joe Mays there on the very latest on this Brexit negotiation. Now, Bloomberg's Maria today will also be speaking with the UK Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, in a panel at the Munich Security Conference. That panel takes place tomorrow, tomorrow on Saturday, 12 p.m. UK. That's 1 p.m. Central European time. And we'll have, of course, all of the highlights on Monday. We'll also be covering all things UK every week on Thursdays. And that's at 9.30 a.m. in our half an hour special. The markets, if we focus on the markets, so far the dollar has been rallying. Stocks have also been dropping along U.S. equity futures with expectations of steeper U.S. rate hikes growing after comments by two 
Federal Reserve officials. Now, if you look at the Bloomberg dollar gauge rising some 0.5 percent, it has erased its losses for the year. Yields on two-year and 10-year Treasuries, both sides 2023 highs this week. Now, data on Thursday, yesterday in the U.S. really showed U.S. Uh, producer prices rebounded in January by the most since June. We did have two Federal Reserve officials talking about uh, some of these steeper U.S. rate hikes. The Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland President Loretta Mester said she'd seen a compelling economic case for rolling out another 50 basis point hike. St. Louis uh, Fed President James Bullard also said he would not rule out supporting a half percentage point increase at the March meeting. The other story we need to watch out for is uh, Isabel Schnabel. Now, she spoke exclusively to our Alexander Weber and Diana Rando in Frankfurt. She is one of the most senior officials, of course, at the ECB. And she basically says that investors risk undermining the persistence of inflation and the response needed to bring it under control. I don't know if we have a full screen of what exactly Isabel Schnabel has said, but she says, look, we're still far away from victory. And actually, the markets could be getting it wrong. So we'll have a full look of that, the hawkus messaging from the ECB and from the Fed. Let's also take a look at some of the key things that markets are watching out for today. 11.30 a.m., it's the ECB's François Villeroy de Gallo. He will comment on monetary policy and inflation in Paris. 1.30 p.m., Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin will speak at two reporters at an event in Virginia. And then a short time later, we hear from Fed Governor Michelle Bauman. And then it's the Munich Security Conference where our Maria today is attending. Coming up, we're joined by the Infosys President, Mohit Joshi. Uh, we'll discuss the skills market, the risk of recession, and much more. That interview coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Here are your top stories. The stocks drop the dollar rallies after Fed hawks Loretta Mester and James Bullard signal support for steeper rate hikes. China's top tech banker Bao Fang goes missing, fueling speculation of a renewed government clampdown on the finance industry. And NatWest shares plunge as the British lender posts higher costs and misses profit estimates, but announces a bigger than expected share buyback. Well, good morning, everyone. Bl welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francie Lacqua here in London. Now, let's get straight to an interview with the president of one of India's biggest tech companies, Infosys, shrugged off fears of a global economic downturn in its earnings last month, remaining bullish on its sales forecast. Well, that comes amid mass layoffs in the tech sector. I'm delighted now to be joined by Infosys president Mohit Joshi. Thank you for joining us. I know you want to talk about reskilling. I know you want to talk about the, the war on talent. But first of all, is it easier for you now to, to find the right talent to hire? Thank you, Francine. So first of all, I think, look, there has been an improvement as far as the talent situation is concerned. And we have seen levels of attrition, you know, go down yeah. in the industry as a whole. Uh, the industry as a whole is still growing. It's still absorbing an incredible amount of talent. And just historically, right, if you look at our business, for instance, 350,000 employees, we hire probably 100,000 plus people every year. So just historically, we have built that infrastructure to train people, to reskill people. And that's really helpful at a time like this. But developers and engineers were extremely expensive, yes. especially in the middle of, of COVID-19. Yes. Yes. Is that getting easier? Are they I getting cheaper? I think so. Cheaper? I, I think so. I think uh, I wouldn't say that they're getting cheaper. Okay. Uh, but if you think about it, right, our levels of attrition had probably peaked about maybe 15 or 16 uh, months ago. And we have seen a steady decline, including in the most recent quarter. And we think that this decline will continue. So uh, the reduction in the attrition rates, I think, is a very strong positive. Uh, that we are seeing. How, how much time are you focusing on actually reskilling? I know this is one of <laughs> you know your biggest passions. One of the things yes. actually that certainly this economy probably needs the most. Yes. There's always a problem with timeline. Is that we need workers, skilled workers now? Yeah. Reskilling takes time. I agree. But look, I think this is something that you need to do programmatically, right? And this is something which is really built into the DNA of the company, of Infosys. And so just historically, uh, earlier we used to build these gigantic campuses, you know, including the largest uh, corporate university in the world and a very large 3,500 people campus in the U.S. Yeah. So historically, you know, you send people to corporate universities to train them. And then now, obviously, you supplement that with very powerful digital platforms. And the uptake is really powerful, right? I think the thing is that we often underestimate how motivated employees are to learn. 
Uh, so if you look at our learning platform, for instance, we see about you know uh, 15 to 20,000 people log in you know every single minute of the day, learning for about 45 to 50 minutes a day. Uh, we look at about a thousand people yep. a day taking proctored assessments to gain certification. So. Uh, a, the employees themselves are very motivated. Mm -hmm. And as far as we're concerned, look, we have a visibility into the business for the next four or five years. So building out that roadmap of what skills you're likely to need and then making sure that you're able to match the training program to that. But you're, you're a private company. Why are governments not doing this more? Is it, is it a matter of spending or does it need to be private-public partnerships? I think, look, I think uh, that governments are now getting into the motion as well. Right? And I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, in the UK, for instance, we've tried up with the Brent Council. Yeah. Now, the Brent Council, as you know, is in London, right? And we've opened up our digital learning platform to everybody right. who lives in the Brent Council. There are about 50,000 people now who are actually learning. And once they've learned, they've been certified, there's the opportunity for them to get jobs with us or with other people. Yep. And, and, so, and that's something that, that will lead to meaningful changes in terms of reskilling. I think so. Look, I think 50,000 yeah. people in a council is a pretty reasonable number. And we've got at least three or four other councils that are looking to follow suit. Yeah. Uh, we're also working with the council so that we can help the small businesses become more digital ready and more digital savvy. So, uh, look, you know, whenever we speak to governments across the world, right, whether it's in Europe or in Asia or in Latin America, governments are very keen to build those tech skills and to get those tech jobs. On the one hand, there is a shortage of digital labor across the world. And on the other hand, these are really well-paying jobs. Uh, Mohit, talk to me a little bit about what you're seeing in the world economy. So the mm. world is bracing for a recession. I mean, it yes. kind of depends on the day or, yes. or sometimes yes. on the hour, given the volatility that we're yeah. seeing markets. What are you hearing from clients? Are they spending less on tech or more? Sure, sure, Francine. So look, I think you covered it when you, when you kicked us off, saying that when we announced our results uh, for the third quarter in the first week of January, we'd given a... Uh, like I would say a reasonably positive assessment about how we see the market. Clearly there are weaknesses in some sub-segments, for instance, in you know, mortgage origination or some parts of the retail business. But on the whole, the spending for tech remained really resilient. And uh, I think uh, people also are consolidating in favor of the larger and stronger companies like us. Uh, we also spoke briefly about uh, you know, Davos, and we were both there just uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I would say that the mood has certainly improved, right? The mood has certainly improved. I think the strength of the U.S. customer, uh, the U.S. consumer, is really holding up the U.S. economy. I think the uh, European uh, situation is better than we had feared in October. Uh, there's a lot of optimism that uh, growth in China will again reboot the world economy. So. Is there, uh, it, it is, you know, the world does seem to be in a more positive place than just four months optimistic? ago. Well, when you look at the world, I mean, what, what surprises me, and I try and cover this, yes. you know, day in, day out, is that actually we've gone from interest rates, yeah. the rise in interest rates have been so quick that I don't know yeah. whether there's a delay effect of something ugly coming up. I agree. Look, that is always a fear. There's always the fear that uh, we have underestimated the damage mm -hmm. that high rates can do to the economy. Uh, but I'd much rather have, you know, too much optimism than what we had in May of last year, right? Like in May of last year, when you were in Davos, it was borderline suicidal, right, the mood. And so I think we went into uh, the start of the year with very low expectations and maybe thinking that there's a shoe to drop in January or February, very large pullbacks. And the fact that that hasn't happened, the fact that the consumer has stayed strong. Uh, I was in a number of sessions with the banks, right? And banks are constantly looking at their data yes. in terms of spending, in terms of, you know, incomes. And what they're saying consistently is that the consumer is very strong. And I think that's helped power the economies. Yeah, we had a bit of a, and that's what NatWest said today, but actually the share price is down 8%. So that's maybe another yeah. story. Can you give us a, a glimpse into when you look at your clients, who's doing well and who's not in terms of industry? Because that always, you're such a great barometer to make us understand yeah. who's spending in this kind of world economy. Yeah. So look, I think, uh, you know, uh, if you look at the financial services business, right, the large global banks and the large American banks are still doing well, and a number of them, including a Bank of America, for instance, have stated their optimism and their desire to keep investing from a technology perspective. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the utilities and the energy companies, you know, they have done really well, you know, through this uh, uh, cycle. Uh, some of the digital natives among the retailers are doing uh, really well. But on the whole, I would say that the U.S. economy has been a gigantic source of strength. In some other industries also, even if they're not doing really well, if you look at the auto industry, for instance, the move to electric vehicles, the move to digitization is such a powerful force uh, pushing technology spend uh, that it has uh, had a very positive impact on our business. How are you thinking about possible M&A? Are, are there targets out there because valuations are quite cheap? 
Well, I think, look, you know, we have been, uh, we've never been hugely acquisitive as a company, but over the past four years, uh, we've made 10 acquisitions. Uh, we've also entered into three joint ventures. Uh, we did one actually in Europe quite recently, Base uh, Life Sciences, which is a company very focused on digital technologies in the healthcare space. So we're going to continue looking at, uh, you know, at uh, possible targets. We have a really strong balance sheet, a lot of cash and no debt. So that makes us, uh, gives us the ability to really pounce if something is attractive. And, and you, is, are things attractive at the moment? Again, just in terms of valuations, whether well, you want to buy them or not, is, yeah. does everything feel I, a bit I, depressed? I, I don't think that pricing in this industry has really dropped as much. And okay. while, you know, I, I think some of the uh, price earnings ratios have compressed a bit, yeah. Uh, I, I don't think that you've seen the sort of drops that you've seen in SaaS software, for instance. I think services companies, uh, the pricing and the valuations have been more resilient. All right. Thank you so much for coming on today. I hope we make this a regular slot, actually, thank to you, talk Francine. about Great technology and Infosys. That was the Infosys president, Mohit Joshi. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Bank of America is planning to cut jobs in its investment bank, one of the last major holdouts in the industry to bow to cost pressures. Bloomberg sources say the reductions could affect some 200 bankers globally. This as the investment bank industry has been hit by declines in takeovers in stock and also debt offerings. Now, strong demand for expensive trucks is helping General Motors fund its transition to a bigger offering of electric vehicles. In an exclusive interview, CEO Mary Barra says it will give GM's big year for EVs as production does ramp up. When I look at our, um, our portfolio of internal combustion engines, I'm really excited about it. And they're doing well. The customers are responding. I mean, you know, we see, still see very strong demand for, for our trucks, our full-size SUVs, the, the uh, Chevrolet Suburban in Tahoe, the GMC Yukon and the Escalade. Again, we can't build enough of them. And China Renaissance shares plunged as much as 50% in Hong Kong trading today after the disappearance of high-profile banker Bao Fan. The company says it lost touch with its co-founder, one of the country's most prolific deal makers. The report is fueling speculation of a renewed clampdown on China's finance industry. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans, and this is Bloomberg. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, today's Big Take looks at the hedge fund's winners and losers of 2022. The 15 highest earners in the hedge fund space have brought in almost $14 billion last year. Now, here with me to discuss all of this is Bloomberg's Charlie Wells. Charlie, first of all, it's a fantastic, fantastic Big Take. Who are the winners and losers? Well, when you look at it, it really is the multi-strategy and macro managers who had an incredibly lucrative 2022. So people like Ken Griffin, who topped the list at Citadel, he brought home over $4 billion last year. Steve Cohn at point seventy two, he brought just about $2 billion. But still, when you look at Ken Griffin's pay package, that is double the number two person. And that is the most that we have seen on this list since 2019 when we started compiling this data. Interesting, there's been a new entrant at number six. It is Saeed Haydar of Hadar Capital, and he made a really interesting conviction call last year on inflation. He didn't think that there would be a pivot as soon as many others did. He brought in a return to investors of 193%, which brought him to number six on this list. Now, some of the losers were some of those long short funds, the yeah. Chase Coleman's of Tiger Global, who lost $1.7 billion, the Dan so Sundimes of Sundime Capital. Yeah, and, and so it just it really does like hammer home the fact that you know strategy is everything. It really speaks to the fact that at least right now we're seeing this multi-strategy, this macro focus really become or was lucrative last year. But looking at Hadar Capital, you know their January wasn't very good, and this speaks to the fact as well that these strategies shift and that money can be made quickly. When you think about Chase Coleman, you know he was at the top of this list just a few years ago, bringing home three billion dollars. Of course, last year losing one point seven billion. Charlie, thank you so much for all of the insight. Charlie Wells there on our big take on hedge funds. Coming up, the Munich Security Conference kicks off today with the war in Ukraine, of course, expected to dominate discussions. We'll bring you the details. This is Bloomberg.
Next week will mark one year of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, an action that upended global political relationships as well as financial markets and economies. Guy Johnson has more on how the conflict has changed the world. The war in Ukraine has arguably provoked the most profound change in the world order since World War II, one in which Vladimir Putin has found himself increasingly isolated. I'm taking robust action to make sure the pain of our sanctions is targeted at Russian economy. The West responded with a show of unity, both with sanctions on Russia and with billions of dollars in aid for Ukraine. NATO allies have provided increasing amounts of weapons to Kyiv, including rocket launchers, air defense systems, and more recently, dozens of combat vehicles. The joint efforts have led to a renaissance for NATO, but the war has also caused an economic dilemma for the West. Overdependency uh, on commodities uh, from uh, authoritarian regimes like Russia makes us vulnerable, and we should not repeat that mistake uh, when it comes to China. The war has brought Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping closer. China has increased imports of Russian oil, but also sought support over Taiwan. Russia has also turned to Iran to defy sanctions, with a new $25 billion trade route through the Caspian Sea. Others, like India, have declined to condemn Russian aggression while benefiting from cheaper oil. Meanwhile, Turkey is playing the mediator role amid deepening economic ties with Russia. Putin stands firm because he is dominating the political scene. There is no media freedom, there is no NGOs, there is no opposition, but people feel the effects of, of Russia's isolation. As such, the future world order could well be defined by the length of the conflict, as well as Vladimir Putin's support abroad and at home. Bloomberg's Guy Johnson there on the impact of the Ukraine war on the world order. Now, one of the world's leading forums for geopolitical debate, the Munich Security Conference, also kicks off today. The war in Ukraine is expected to dominate discussions. Now, for more, we're joined by Bloomberg's Maria Today in Munich. Maria, what are you looking at for at the Munich Security Conference? Yes, Francine, and here we are back at the Munich Security Conference. And by the way, we just saw the head of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, walk here uh, into the hotel. I'm sure she's going to be pleased by the moves that we've seen in the gas market today, dropping below 50 euros megawatt hour. This is essentially what the commission would say is to some extent mission accomplished. But going to the core of discussions today, it really is about Ukraine. Remember, a year ago, almost exactly by the same date, Volodymyr Zelensky was here telling the world, we do not want a war, but we're ready for it. And Russia essentially lied until the last moment, saying there would be no invasion. Now we have a full-scale war going into its first year. We are going to hear from the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. We're also going to hear from Emmanuel Macron. A lot of questions around what happens in the next few weeks. The offensive from Russia already seems to be underway, but also the idea of the future framework for security in Europe. It is clear now that the recipe that existed before a friendly relationship with Russia is no longer the case. So the comments from the German Chancellor on that front will be particularly interesting. So, Maria, beyond Ukraine, where does this leave international relations, especially in the light of these tensions between the U.S. and China over the balloon? Yes, the balloon, the, the flying object, I think it's, it's difficult at this point to describe it. But uh, look, the, the good thing about a conference like this uh, for diplomats is that there is back-channel diplomacy that happens behind the scenes. You know this very well. You've covered them for many years. And Francine, there will be a delegation from the United States led by the VP uh, Harris. There will be a delegation also from the Chinese led by their top diplomat, Wang Yi. He will also speak in a forum uh, here tomorrow. There's a lot of curiosity about the comments that he may make, not just on the United States, but also the war in Ukraine. Remember, there is disappointment that China has not played the mediator role that some would hope uh, Xi Jinping would do with the Russian president. So I think come Monday, it'll be interesting to see whether the conference actually served to cool down tensions between the U.S. and China. Yesterday, President Biden, by the way, already indicated that he wants to have a call with a Chinese leader after the balloon saga. Uh, Maria, thank you so much. Uh, Maria Tadeo there with a really packed weekend. She will be speaking with the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak at a panel tomorrow at the Munich Security Conference. I really can't wait uh, to see what the Prime Minister says with Maria. The panel takes place Saturday, 12 p.m. UK time.
1 p.m. Central European time. And we'll, of course, have all of the highlights on Monday. Coming up, a consortium led by Qatari Royals is said to be planning a multi-billion pound takeover of Manchester United Football Club. We'll have more details on the proposed bit next. And this is Bloomberg. Let's talk football. Sources have told Bloomberg that Qatari investors are preparing a roughly five billion pound opening bid for Manchester United Football Club. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg Opinions, Matthew Brooker, who looks at, of course, not only Qatar, but football. And his latest piece says, look, a Qatari bid for Man U, Manchester United would be a mismatch. So, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, what do we know about what this bid looks like? We know that Jim Ratcliffe was interested. The Qataris potentially have more money. Do we have any idea of pricing? Uh, we don't at, at this stage. Um, I think the Glazers said they wanted at least uh, five or six billion. Um, Manchester United is listed in New York and yep. uh, last time I looked was, was worth around about four billion. So, you know, you're looking at about, you know, 50% markup on, on what, the current, what the market currently assesses uh, the club to be worth. And, so, and, and there's a number, I mean, there's so much money swirling around, frankly, in, you know, UK football since Chelsea got taken over by Todd Bowley. Does it change the way that this is perceived? We also spoke with the Qatar Investment Authority in Davos, and they were quite clear, look, there's opportunity in football. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I think it really ex exacerbates the issues that football is grappling with at the moment. I mean, you... you uh, a, a, a very expensive takeover of Man United by a deep-pocketed investor um, like this uh, Qatari uh, vehicle would doubtless be good for Manchester United's prospects as a, uh, as, as a business and uh, uh, for, for on-field success if it gets a lot of investment and it ups its transfer spending. Um, but at the same time, that's going to um, exacerbate this problem of, uh, you know, the real concentration of yeah. economic power at the top of the game. Uh, and how that's affecting the rest of English football and indeed the rest of European football. So, Matthew, do we have any idea of the intention of the Qataris? They already own PSG. It's unclear whether it's, you know, the same group of billionaires or another. Well, they, they would have to argue that it's that they are separate. Yeah. Um, they, uh, the Qatari Investment Authority, which is the Qatari Sovereign Wealth Fund, already owns uh, Paris Saint-Germain yeah. um, in France. And um, UEFA rules would, would prohibit, if, they, if, if, if the same investor was deemed to own both PSG and Manchester United, then they wouldn't be able to compete in the same European competitions together. So it would be essential uh, for the Qatari uh, consortium uh, to, have, uh, to be recognised as being separate from the, the, from the Qatari fund that owns PSG. Yeah. And it's unclear at the moment whether, no. whether they would... But, Matthew, be is it because they're fans or because they really hope to make money out of it? Is the Super League going to be back? Um, you know, I mean, the financial structure of football is, is very interesting. I mean, when you look at the, the, the finances for Manchester United, I mean, for me, it's very, it's very <laughs> difficult to see how this turns into uh, an economic return, unless the economic structure of the uh, yeah. game changes, which may be what they're looking for. Thank you so much for joining us today. Bloomberg Opinions, Matthew Brooker. Now, the dollar is rallying. Stocks are dropping along U.S. equity futures. There are expectations of steeper U.S. rate hikes growing after comments by two Federal Reserve officials. We also had an interview with uh, Isabel Schnabel of the ECB, one of the most senior officials there, saying that investors risk underestimating the persistence of inflation and underestimate the response needed to bring it under control. So Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller in New York and Edwards in London. And this is Bloomberg. There's all, a whole range of possibilities that are out there with very different implications. It comes down to inflation. Do we get back to this dis disinflationary trend or do we see a plateau? I don't think the disinflationary story is over, but we have to be aware that it's going to take time. 
It's just much harder to get a good read on the market, right? These moves are amplified, so you can't see that. We're still going for quality. Uh, and that's because we're in an environment where, again, the economy we don't think is going into recession, but there will be some deceleration. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller. It is 5 a.m. in New York, 10 a.m. in London, 6 p.m. in Hong Kong. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Jennifer Zabasaja stepping in for Anna Edwards in London. Our top stories today, Hawks at the Federal Reserve make the case for bigger interest rate hikes. They say the central bank should be prepared to move higher and hold for longer. Plus, American shoppers are using their credit cards more than ever before. Credit card balances have hit a record high of almost $1 trillion, and delinquency rates are rising as well. And shares of Mercedes-Benz are rising after the German automaker announces its first buyback in 15 years. We'll hear from the CEO, Ola Kalenius. First off, let's get a quick check at what's going on in the markets. After the drops that we saw yesterday, the S&P uh, fell down to 4,094,090. So that is still above the year-end consensus. 24 strategies that we surveyed expect 40.75 at the year end, and that's what we're seeing right now on futures, down to just about half a percent. Remember, I said year end, right? It's only uh, almost the end of February, so we still have a long way to go before there. We saw a big jump in the 10-year yield as investors sell those bonds off on the Fed speak. You can see right now we're up another three and a half basis points, but almost back to 390. So we're at the highest level that we've seen all year long on the 10-year yield, on the two-year yield as well. Right now, the 10-year, 389.41, going out five significant digits. The Bloomberg dollar index also putting up a big jump, and the dollar index erasing completely all of its losses for 2023. So 12.49 is where we are sitting right now. That's still about 100 points off of the all-time high that we hit in 2022. But again, erasing losses um, for this year so far. And Bitcoin taking a big dive down. At one point, it was down 6%, its biggest drop since November of last year. Also on concern um, that Fed officials are coming out more and more. So far, it's been two non-voting members, right? Mester and Bullard, we're going to talk about that, um, saying that rates maybe need to move higher than had been previously anticipated and stay there for longer. Take a look at what's going on in Europe. The stock 600 is down about two-thirds of 1% right now. Although, uh, on a, a positive note, we see natural gas futures contracts falling to the lowest level that we've seen in 17 or 18 months right now. So below $50 um, for European natural gas futures as uh, this story has really turned around, right? We saw Europe spend over a trillion dollars on ex excess energy costs since the beginning of the uh, Russian war in Ukraine. Brent crude is coming down and so are oils across the complex. 83.54 is what we see for the global benchmark in terms of what we see here in New York, West Texas Intermediate is trading for about 77 and change. And then Mercedes, also a positive story, up more than 3%, even though the CEO said they may have profit that's lower than last year. Still, they're buying back $4 billion worth of shares, and that trumps um, a weak outlook. Uh, let's get over to Jennifer Zabasaja now. She's got uh, more on two of the biggest central banks in the world making hawkish statements. Jen? Yeah, yeah, Matt, that's right. I mean, two of the Fed's most hawkish policymakers are signaling they may favor returning to bigger interest rate hikes to fight inflation. We heard from Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester, who said that she saw a compelling case for a 50 basis point hike at the most recent Fed meeting. And that view is also echoed by St. Louis Fed President James Buller. Take a listen. I think we can lock in this disinflationary trend by continuing to have policy rate increases during 2023, even though the real economy looks like it's going to uh, continue to grow and the labor market uh, broadly across the country looks like it remains strong. Now let's bring in Bloomberg Markets reporter Valerie Titel, who is joining us here in studio. So Valerie, Hawks are now saying that they're open to a 50 basis point rate increase. Are we just back to worrying again about the pace of increases? Uh, give us your assessment. 
Yeah, look, that door being open to a 50-point rate rise, even though they were hawks and, yes, they are non-voters, the, still the fact they've come out and said it is quite jarring and the markets are, are following suit. I want to go over a few of the things they said. Mester and Bullard both throwing their weight back into a possible 50 basis point rate rise in the, in the March meeting, but they also claimed that they advocated for a 50 basis point rise in their Jan meeting. Now, we didn't know about this because they're non-voters. It didn't necessarily show up in a dissent, but it's no Notable because in January we had a string of weak data going into that meeting. They were still pushing for a 50. Makes me think they're going to be out there even even hotter claiming uh, claiming for a 50 in that March meeting. And again, because Brainerd is leaving the Fed, it might leave a seat open for a voter. And it, it's known that Mester could possibly be a voter in the March meeting if Goldsby's seat at the Chicago Fed isn't replaced in time. That's a lot to take in. Yes, but we also hear from Feds Barkin and. Fed's Bowman later today. Could they add fuel to this fire? But I want to take a look at what two-year yields have done. They are now 10 basis points away from 15-year highs. Just looking at this chart gives me some heart palpitations. <laughs> We're now sitting at 469. The high in November was 479. So keep that number in mind. I, I'm honestly shocked we haven't traded through this given that 50 basis point chat yesterday. But look, we got more hawkish Fed speak to come. And this looking ahead to next week. We also get the preliminary uh, uh, PMI data uh, for the U.S. and then we get the final core PCE print. That's the Fed favors measure of inflation on Friday. Speaking of heart palpitations, uh, Valerie, yesterday I spoke with Mar Mary Barra. Um, she said that consumers on the lower end, they're starting to see delinquencies rise there. Plus, then I saw a, a story, credit card balances in the U.S. reaching nearly a trillion dollars. Uh, that's according to a report from the New York Fed. Those delinquencies are rising as well. To me, this is like, you know, the Jaws music for the coming recession. <laughs> Yeah, so this is dun, coming dun. from a quarterly debt report dun, dun. Uh, from the New York Fed. Uh, the credit card balances are reaching nearly $1 trillion, Matt. Yeah, very, uh, very concerning, I would say. I'm not sure about the level, right? But if delinquencies are rising, and right now we're talking about 4%, which gets uh, to higher levels than we saw back in 2019 and 2018. So um, that is a concern. Valerie Titel there walking us through um, what's going on with the central banks and the U.S. consumer. Meanwhile, over in Germany, shares of Mercedes-Benz are higher. A share buyback and strong fourth quarter performance helping out the luxury car maker, though it said earnings may slip this year. Um, the $4.2 billion buyback is its first in 15 years. Bloomberg's Oliver Crook spoke to the CEO of Mercedes, Ola Kalenius. I think we need to look at the macro environment and what the economy is, is going to do. It's natural that central banks around the world, when uh, inflation has been rising for, for the last uh, year or so, uh, to react with interest rate hikes. And that is designed to clearly uh, put a little bit of a cooling effect on consumption and get the inflation down. So we're watching uh, macro, and that is why uh, we take a slightly cautious uh, view on what the market will do and are guiding for sales around the same level as 2022. Oliver Crook joins us now from the Hauptstadt. Oliver, strong full year numbers, but some concern going into this year. That's right, Matt. And it all ties into what you're talking about this morning, locking in that disinflation in the macro environment. So they've cited exceptional uncertainty going into 2023. Uh, they said that their revenue is going to be dead flat. Sales will fall a little bit. It's down to partially geopolitics, but also down to this idea that, you know, the rates are really starting to squeeze consumers. And that he said that they're, you're not seeing it yet in terms of the models that they're choosing, but it's they're bracing for that. But I think that it's worth actually just spending one second looking back at 2022. It really validates this uh, this this tack that Mercedes has taken to go towards the luxury. If you go to the uh, DAX low point for the pandemic, 2020, uh, March 18th, Mercedes is the best performing stocks on the DAX. It's up more than 300 percent. And if you look at the market cap level, it's overtaken VW. So, you know, a gratifying year, getting some more help this morning with the share buyback. So then, Oliver, I mean, looking ahead, if, if they are taking this cautious outlook, what then uh, are they optimistic about? What is it that's actually going to drive growth for Mercedes past its competitors? So regionally, it's going to be the United States. So you have still strength coming in the United States. There is also a hope of a rebound in China um, after, you know, in, in the latter part of the year. But the category is going to be EVs. So, you know, 
Mercedes had a 70% jump in their EV sales. It's not a huge amount of the proportion of, the, of what they sell, but they want to double that. And then there's also the Inflation Reduction Act. I asked the CEO about that. Have a listen to where that fits in. We uh, uh, try to set up our production structures to, as best possible, meet the demand in the different markets. Uh, and the fact that the Inflation Reduction Act pushes the electric agenda, which goes hand in hand with our strategy, uh, will make it economically more attractive to uh, invest in the United States. Uh, but I also would like to caution that uh, um, governments around the world should not couple that with protectionistic elements of such policies because they have overall growth in the world. So the Inflation Reduction Act supporting sales in the United States. Uh, Europe is going to be sluggish, they said. Uh, so there's some concern there, saying that you really need Europe to match China and the United States in terms of what they're doing in terms of supporting this industry. But the big unknown is going to be China, not just demand, but also an escalation in the geopolitical tensions. This is something they've, risked, uh, they've put out on the outlook as something they're concerned about. It's their biggest market. So if there is a substantial deterioration there, it'll have a very material impact on Mercedes. All right, Oliver, thanks very much. Excellent interview. You can hear more uh, from Oliver's interview with Ola Kalenius throughout the day on Bloomberg Television. You can also see it in full on Bloomberg.com. Now, a bidding war could be brewing for Manchester United. Sources have told Bloomberg a consortium led by Qatari Royals is preparing a roughly $6 billion opening bid to acquire the English football giant from the U.S. Glazer family. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Joe Easton. So, Joe, what's the sense of whether the Qataris will win this bid for Man U? Don't they already own PSG? That's right, Matt, they do. So they do own the French team, the French giants there. But in terms of for Man United, it looks like a really punchy bid. You mentioned their $6 billion. Bear in mind, this stock was trading at around $8 billion, uh, excuse me, $4 billion in terms of market cap before that report broke. So it would be a 50% premium. And we have to take into the fact that that stock doubled since November. So it rose around 100% since we got the news that the Glazers would be looking to sell. The other competing rivals would be Ineos, which is owned by the British billionaire Jim Ratcliffe. And you'd have to question whether they would be willing to put that size deal to the board in terms of a sports investment for that company. The third one to mention is Saudi Arabia. They already own Newcastle here in the UK. So there'll be a potential conflict of interest in terms of Saudi Arabia owning two big clubs in the UK. That would be looked at by the footballing bodies, I think. And so then, Joe, I mean, what does this mean for Manchester United fans? I don't know if you're a fan uh, yourself, but, I mean, what is it that we're looking out for, considering now this bidding war that's sort of brewing at this point in time? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I'm a Chelsea fan, first of all, so <laughs> I'm hoping that uh, they probably don't have as much money to spend. But I think, so Man United say that they have around a billion fans across the globe. So the idea is that they would be able to monetize that. They currently make around $500 million um, dollars in revenue a year. So they're making about half a buck per fan, which isn't a lot. And if you think how the landscape of football has changed in terms of how that's consumed, in terms of social media, Amazon showing games, there's clearly a lot of money to be made. And from the fans' point of view, they would hope that that comes back into the club. But then they would also need to control their wages, which has been the big Achilles heel for them. Players like Ronaldo, who's now left, paying huge amounts of money for those players. If they can keep that down, keep putting money into the club, it would be positive. All right, just pushing those prices uh, ever higher, though, in terms of um, the entire club. Joe, thanks very much for the wrap. Joe Easton there talking to us about Man U and... Uh, telling us that he loves Chelsea. Now let's get a look at some of the stocks we're watching in the pre-market today. A lot going on here. First of all, Moderna, the flu vaccine that they are pushing there yielded mixed results in a final stage trial, not doing as well for flu B as it did for flu A. That raises questions about the drug maker's plan to seek U.S. approval for a flu shot based on the messenger RNA technology. The shares down 5%. Texas Roadhouse reported earnings per share for the fourth quarter that missed the average analyst estimate, they had 89 cents in earnings. We were looking for 103. DoorDash, though, beat analyst estimates with earnings through cost-cutting efforts. And as consumers continue to order pricey takeout, although apparently not enough from Texas Roadhouse, and DraftKings posted fourth quarter sales that beat expectations, raising its revenue guidance for the current year to as much as $3.05 billion. It also forecasts a much narrower loss than had been anticipated. Jen? 
Right. A lot, a lot to look out for, Matt. All right, coming up, it was a wild year for hedge funds in 2022. We're going to talk about the year's biggest winners and losers in just a few minutes. And we're also going to speak with Laura Cooper, senior macro investment strategist at BlackRock. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Jennifer Zabasaja in London. Anna Edwards is off today. Now, Saeed Haider has joined Bloomberg's list of top earning hedge fund managers after personally raking in $859 million last year. Our latest Big Take looks at hedge fund winners and losers of 2022. Bloomberg's Charlie Wells joins us now. And Charlie, I was surprised to learn that does not make him even close to the best earning hedge fund manager of the year. Matt, top spot goes to Ken Griffin of Citadel, bringing in over $4 billion in 2022. That is more than double the number two spot. That was Steve Cohen of Point72, who brought in about $2 billion. And you mentioned Zaid Haydar, and that's a really interesting addition to this list. He came in at number six, almost $900 million, and he is a macro fund manager. Really interestingly, made a strong conviction call in 2022 on some of those leveraged rate bets, and that really paid off. He brought a return to investors last year of 193%, and that really brought him a lot of money as well as his investors. And, Charlie, when it comes to those that lost money, I'm not going to call them losers, but they lost a, a few millions. I mean, is there anything that connects all, all of them together? I mean, what is it that sort of unites their, their decrease in, in salary last Jen, year? Jen, that's a really kind question, I would say, <laughs> to people who are nursing some of these losses. Um, and, look, for, for a lot of these lo long, short fund managers, they really had a difficult 2022 and not a very lucrative one. So I'm talking talking about people like Chase Coleman of Tiger Global. You know, he lost $1.7 billion in 2022. Um, Dan Sendheim of D1 Capital losing $1.1 billion. And it's really striking, and it just shows how quickly things can change, because Chase Coleman, just a few years ago, was actually at the top of this list. Well, we should note that we do this every year, so we'll be back. We'll have you back next year. Thanks to Bloomberg's Charlie Wells uh, for joining us today. Yeah. All right. And you can find all of our Big Take stories on Bloomberg.com and on your terminal at NI Big Take Go. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in London with Matt Miller in New York. Anna Edwards is off today. Now, keeping you up to date with the news from around the world, here is the first word. First up, in Ohio, there's growing criticism over the response to a train derailment that spilled hazardous chemicals in a tiny town. The CEO of Norfolk Southern has pledged to ensure the safety of residents of East Palestine, Ohio. That could cost millions of dollars. The train carried chemicals linked to liver and lung cancer. Also, President Biden expects to speak with China's Xi Jinping soon about that Chinese balloon shot down by the U.S. The president says he hopes, quote, to get to the bottom of this. At the same time, he said he makes no apologies for taking down the balloon. The dispute has highlighted just how fragile relations are between the U.S. and China. Expectations are mounting that the U.K. and the E.U. will reach a deal on post-Brexit trading arrangements in the coming days. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak traveled to Belfast with, to talk with the region's parties. U.K. and European Union negotiators are looking to resolve the dispute over the Northern Ireland Protocols, the part of the Brexit deal which sets out trade policies. And finally, the federal judge overseeing the fraud trial of FTX co-founder Sam Bankman-Fried is threatening to send him to jail. Judge Lewis Kaplan wants severe restrictions placed on Bankman-Fried use of electronic devices and apps. There's also concern over his use of encrypted messaging app Signal to contact FTX's U.S. General Counsel, a potential witness in the case. And Matt, I, I believe that Sam Bankman-Fried actually says that he was using the VPN to watch the Super Bowl, to watch football. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out considering what he said. Yeah, right. Like it's okay for him to illegally tune in with a VPN. First of all, Jen, <laughs> just a quick co-hosting tip on this program whenever we refer to Ohio we always say the great state 
of Ohio because mm. eight no. presidents are from Ohio and it's the official farm team for, for New York City, the capital of the world. So that's just one uh, point on the great state of Biased? Ohio. Okay. okay. No, no, that's how A everyone biased? feels. No. E everyone in this program. <laughs> Secondly, Sam Bankman Freed. He's allowed to use a VPN to pretend he's in a different place so he can watch an NFL game. Is that okay, even if you're not on a $250 million bail package? And also, he's allowed to use Signal to send private messages that can't be detected by the government. How come he's allowed to do all this stuff? <laughs> so you, you think this is, should not be allowed? This should have been outlawed uh, going forward? I would say give the guy, like, an Atari 2600 and a beeper, you know, and that's it. I don't see why he gets all this, you know, and also we say $250 million bail package all the time, but I don't think everything he's put down even amounts to, like, $5 million, so I don't even know why we use that gigantic term. I guess it's just to make it a little more dramatic. Absolutely, yeah. He can miss out on some of these big cultural events considering uh, what's happening. Yeah, and I mean, well, I wouldn't want anyone to have missed out on the Super Bowl. I hope you were able to watch it from London. Coming up, Laura Cooper, senior macro investment strategist over at BlackRock. She's going to talk us through these markets after the continued beats on inflation. We saw CPI and PPI both coming in hot. And after all the Fed speak that we've had and uh, what we're still waiting to hear, this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here is what you need to know today. Hawks at the Federal Reserve make the case for bigger interest rate hikes. They say the central bank should be prepared to move higher and hold longer. Also, American shoppers are using their credit cards more than ever before. Credit card balances have hit a record high of almost a trillion dollars and delinquency rates, they're up as well. And finally, shares of Mercedes-Benz are rising after the German automaker announced its first buyback in 15 years. We're gonna hear from the CEO and continue to talk about this. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in London with Matt Miller in New York. Or with Matt Miller in New York, Anna Edwards is off today. Matt, we were talking about Mercedes. We're going to continue to dive into that uh, and take a look at what the markets are doing uh, before the open. Yeah, I'm pumped. We're going to hear more from uh, Mercedes CEO Ole Kalenius. We're also going to hear more from GM CEO Mary Barra. So a lot of auto news in the markets for us to digest on this Friday. Let's take a look at what's going on in the markets. We were down more than 1% on the S&P and the NASDAQ yesterday. We're looking at S&P futures that are off again this morning, about six tenths of 1% down to 4073. By the way, 4075 is strategist average year end target. Um, and remember, we still have 10 months and one week to go until the end of the year. So we're already there. That may be concerning for some investors. We are seeing selling bonds after all this very hawkish Fed talk and the yield now going up to um, as near as damn it, I believe is what the British would say, to 390. Right now, 389.99 to go out five significant digits. The Bloomberg dollar index rising today. That's no good for risk assets. We're up to 1250 almost. That's still 100 points off of um, the high that we saw last year, but the dollar index has erased all of its gains for 2023. And I should point out we're seeing yields on government debt at the highest level this year, from the 10-year uh, from the, to the two-year um, here in the U.S. Bitcoin is falling today. It hit almost 25,000. Now it's back down under 24 at 23,732, but taking a big hit also on this Fed talk and as U.S. regulators crack down on uh, Bitcoin businesses. Let's take a look at some of the pre-market movers. Moderna is one of the big losers this morning. Its flu vaccine had mixed results in a final stage trial that raises questions about its plan to seek approval for a messenger RNA technology uh, flu vaccine. Apparently it didn't work very well for flu influenza B. It works very well for flu influenza A, but it's got to do both. Texas Roadhouse also down this morning reporting earnings per share for the fourth quarter that missed the average analyst estimate. We were looking at 89 cents. We were hoping for 103, so a pretty decent miss. And DoorDash beat. DoorDash is the delivery business. Earnings uh, were better than the analyst expectations. They're cutting costs, and also consumers are buying pricey takeout. 
So at the higher end of the spectrum there, DraftKings also beat fourth quarter sales were ahead of expectations and DraftKings raised its revenue guidance for the full year to as much as $3.05 billion plus forecast a much narrower loss that puts them in a good place. And that's why the shares are up more than 6% in the pre-market. Valerie Titel has a check on what's going on in European markets, what we heard from Isabel Schnabel and also a look at delinquencies. Valerie? Yeah, sure. Across the European fixed income space, we are weak. We're seeing German two-year yields rising nearly six basis points. We did have that hawkish commentary from the ECB, but this is really reacting a lot to what the U.S. did yesterday into the close. I say that because euro is lower on the day, so dollar strength is really taking over, so the higher yields across Europe are not being reflected in a higher euro. The stock 600 Europe, that's also down nearly six-tenths of a percent, taking some beating uh, going on from the equity weakness into the close yesterday. And I've got Nat West up on here. They reported today, even though they announced an 800 uh, million pound uh, share buyback and their net interest margin came in higher, analysts were more focused on the reporting of higher costs and they guided profits slightly below expectations. So that's Nat, Nat West down nearly 7%. It's the worst performer in the FTSE 100. But speaking of consumer lending, I want to shift back over to what's going on in the U.S. and talk a little bit about debt delinquencies. Now this data and this chart comes from that quarterly report from the New York Fed released yesterday and it showed that U.S. credit card delinquencies are on the rise and the important thing to note here Matt is that it's especially in the rise amongst the young people. What do we know about the young people? Well they've already gotten um, student loan forgiveness right? So this is happening these delinquencies on young people's credit cards are rising even though their student their student loan forgiveness uh, that you know that continues until August this year. So should we be worried about these delinquencies starting to to tick up. Uh, you know, we, we have a lot coming from the U.S. economy in terms of these rate rises. Perhaps this might be a little canary in the coal mine as we start seeing these credit card balances balloon and delinquencies rise. That's what I'm talking about, a canary in the coal mine. Thank you very much, Valerie Titel. Joining us now is Laura Cooper, BlackRock Senior Macro Investment Strategist. Laura, um, I confused and concerned everybody with my Jaws tune earlier, but it does seem like this <laughs> is the coming of the recession, right? We're hearing about this and uh, delinquencies in auto loans, delinquencies in mortgages, delinquencies in credit card payments, and now a trillion dollars total balance. Does it worry you? Well, I think it is it probably is a little bit concerning that we are starting to see the deterioration in the markets in terms of what we're seeing in, on the economic data. But ultimately, you know, this is still an environment where we've clearly seen robust U.S. economic data. So if anything, I would argue that are we starting to see signs of that earlier monetary tightening start to feed through economic activity? It's probably too soon to declare that. But I think ultimately it does set up for, as you mentioned, yes, a U.S. recession, but likely delayed to the latter half of the year. And I think markets still have some catch up in terms of price action to reflect that deteriorating backdrop. What do you think about the Fed in terms of higher for longer? We heard from a couple non-voting members, but it would make sense given um, this hotter inflation data we're seeing. Do you expect a terminal rate of like 550 and will they hold well into 2024? Well, I think that the fact that we did see this exceptionally strong data, whether that come through in the retail sales or just signs that inflation pressures continue to remain sticky, really does suggest that, yes, the Fed is going to have this higher for longer kind of cycle. We do expect that the, the risks to the terminal rate are likely higher than our current expectations around that 5.25% mark in the back of that. But really what's been interesting is what's happening in markets. So there was this disconnect between Fed commentary and what we were seeing in terms of market price and easing, we've now seen kind of rates markets come catch up to the Fed commentary. Now I think what we're starting to see is equities catch on to that as well. The fact that, look, this could actually be a Fed that has to tighter, tighten much more than market expectations because this economic data is proving quite resilient. And Laura, can we talk about currencies? I mean, Matt mentioned that the dollar uh, erased, or it's at its uh, high, six-week high erased its losses for the year. I mean, does that rally continue based on the data that we got uh, this week, based on uh, the commentary that we got from the Fed uh, speak this week. Well, I think the dollar is likely going to struggle to sustain the pace of gains that we've seen year to date because this is largely being driven by the front end repricing as we do see rates markets price out that easing, start to pay attention to that Fed commentary. And when we look at something like the euro dollar cross, the fact that it has come under pressure in February, but yet 
we did have those comments from Isabel Schnabel suggesting that, look, inflation risks are still tilted to the upside. The European economy does show resilience. That could actually tilt towards an even higher terminal rate for Europe, which is probably has more room to be priced in, and the potential for the Fed to pause ahead of the ECB. So I think those key tailwinds for the euro have yet to play out. What does that mean for your investment strategy then? I mean, what are you paying attention to specifically? Well, I think ultimately at this point, we're still quite cautious on the broader equity backdrop across developed market economies. If we think at what's driven the rally year to date, we think it's largely because, yes, markets have front run a lot of the positive news around this European improved outlook, past peak inflation, China reopening. But as well, if we think about a lot of the moves have been kind of the short covering. We've seen a lot of equity, uh, sorry, options derivatives kind of under underlying that this price action. So ultimately, we struggled to see what could be that further catalyst to continue the strength. And I think the fact that we are starting to see earnings come in fairly mixed, that is going to feed into kind of still a cautious position on equities. Laura, we had at the beginning of the year, everybody was so psyched for Europe. It was finally going to be better off than the U.S. because they didn't have any of these big tech stocks and their heavy energy. And people were pumped about emerging markets as well. Those two um, uh, trades seem to have faded a little bit. What's your take on regions? Yeah, and it's really, it's actually been ca captured quite well in terms of when we look at flow data. So sitting where we do at BlackRock, we do have iShares, which is a really good proxy for global risk sentiment. And we've actually seen Europe in January had the largest inflows in more than a year. We had EM as well gather that momentum that we saw through 2022. And interestingly, that came at the expense of drawdowns in U.S. equities. So clearly investors were taking this barbell approach where they were seeking those kind of higher beta exposures in Europe in EM and also also that high quality credit but at the expense of the US now the fact that the US is under has outperformed Europe more recently I think that does suggest that investors are going to go back into that higher quality US stocks as we do see some of that momentum in Europe fade because this is still a challenging economic environment and I would argue that the inflation risks are actually probably greater in Europe than they are in the US that's really yet to be reflected in prices what specifically in terms of inflation risk I mean what is it that you think think is really going to drive the overall uh, global inflation picture uh, moving forward? Well, I think ultimately, when we look at Europe, for example, the fact that the economic growth has come in much better than expected, and so markets are kind of priced for this, this inflation to go well below 2%, but it, really, it, this economic resiliency suggests that inflation could come in actually hotter. We start to see kind of that further tightness in the labor market, spilling into wages, consumer confidence starting to resume. That could actually enable the ECB to go even higher for longer. And that's really the key risk that could potentially trigger the European economy into a recession, albeit delayed, later this year. Wow. Laura Cooper of BlackRock, thanks as always for being here and thanks for your time. All right, coming up, the evolution to electric vehicles speeds up. We hear from the CEO of General Motors and Mercedes on the rising demand for their electric vehicles. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Jennifer Zabasaja in London. Anna Edwards is off today. Now, General Motors says its strong sales of gas-powered vehicles are paving the road for their future in EVs. Bloomberg's David Weston spoke exclusively with GM CEO Mary Barra on their sales strength and where the company is heading. When I look at our, um, our portfolio of internal combustion engines, I'm really excited about it. And they're doing well. The customers are responding. I mean, you know, we see, still see very strong demand for, for our trucks, our full-size SUVs, the, the uh, Chevrolet Suburban in Tahoe, the GMC Yukon, and the Escalade. Again, we can't build enough of them. And so I'm excited about the demand. The customers are really responding. And that kind of response, and, you know, especially when they want to buy up-level models, is, is really what is giving us the ability to uh, you know, generate the profitability. Uh, we had strong profitability last year that allows us to continue invest from an EV perspective. You are in investment mode. You're putting tens of billions of dollars into electric vehicles. And yet you've uh, really pledged you're going to maintain margins to the best mm -hmm. of your ability. 
Uh, you have to do that in part by costs. Right. And, and I wonder, any business I've ever seen, you're always spending too much in some places and too little in others. Right. As you look forward to the future of General Motors, where do you think you need to spend more? Where do you think you need to spend less? Well, I think uh, any part of the business can be made more efficient. Even the areas when you're growing, you can still look at how do I grow efficiently. What I, one of the things I always tell the team is, I want you to be scrappy. <laughs> um, you know, pretend it's you know your own money and it's your last dollar. How are you going to spend it? And getting that kind of creativity, I think that's when people do their best work. And so, you know, clearly we're optimizing our internal combustion uh, business, but making sure we're uh, giving the customer everything they want and more, surprise and delighting them. But we found that we can do that with a lot less complexity. For instance, I mentioned the Chevrolet Trex that will have one engine. And so, you know, that uh, allows us to do the vehicle in a very efficient manner, but still meet the customer uh, needs. But we've also found that, you know, uh, through COVID, we found we could take cost out, reduce bureaucracy. Um, and now we've got to, you know, continue to get at that. And that's why we announced with earnings, even though it was record earnings, we announced that and committed to take $2 billion out of structural cost between 23 and 24. And I know the team can do it. That was GM CEO Mary Barra speaking with Bloomberg's David Weston. And another driver in the EV race, Mercedes. Bloomberg's Oliver Crook sat down with the Mercedes CEO earlier today. I think we need to look at the macro environment and what the economy is, is going to do. It's now that central banks around the world, when uh, inflation has been rising for, for the last uh, year or so, uh, to react with interest rate hikes. And that is designed to clearly uh, put a little bit of a cooling effect on consumption and get the inflation down. So we're watching uh, macro, and that is why uh, we take a slightly cautious uh, view on what the market will do and are guiding for sales around the same level as 2022. Uh, but at the same time, uh, our business model is very robust with a guidance of between 12 and 14 percent return on sales. Uh, if we execute well, 2023 can be another good year for us. And so you cite the consumer there being squeezed a bit. Are you seeing that change in kind of the cars that people are choosing to buy? Are you seeing a change in consumer behavior due to that squeeze? Not yet. Uh, we have been seeing on uh, nudging up in the segments that we in and also uh, uh, making sure that our top end offering is very attractive. In fact, in 2022, our top end vehicle sales grew by 8%, and we are looking at uh, another slight growth on the top end side for this. So uh, managing your portfolio and uh, making sure that you find the right operating point in the market, I think, will be key for 2023. Um, and on that subject, you cut prices for the EQS over in China. Um, how has that reacted in terms of sales? Has that worked? And what went wrong there? Uh, what we're trying to do with products around the world is uh, very much like other luxury companies do, is sure that you have uh, somehow level pricing around the world so that equivalent products have roughly the same price uh, levels uh, in the main markets. Uh, that's what we did with two models in China. Uh, last year, our battery electrical sales grew by just shy of 70 percent. Uh, this year, uh, we will be in a position to double our sales of battery electric vehicles. So uh, the future direction going electric uh, is set and we're executing on it. And China is your, is your biggest market. Obviously, we've seen tensions rise. It's one of the things you cite as a concern uh, in your outlook. Um, how is Mercedes preparing in case do things further deteriorate? What is your plan there? Well, the Mercedes model, of course, uh, is also based on the ability to uh, export and import uh, across the world, driven by the WTO uh, rules. Uh, what we have learned from the um, COVID and the supply chain issues that we had mainly on the semiconductor side over the last couple or three years is that we need to create optionality on the supply chains and we're working on that in our main verticals. Mercedes CEO Ola Kalenius there and we heard from the General Motors CEO Mary Barra. My dream car would really be a uh, um, uh, uh, an amalgamation of the two. I'd like to take a Mercedes AMG GT and drop in the Z06 5.5 liter flat plane crank V8. And that would be absolutely amazing. But Jen, I was super excited to hear from Mary, especially yesterday when she talked with David West. And it seems like they're a coiled spring that's just about to explode. They want to sell $50 billion uh, worth of profitable EVs by 2025. That would put them well above 
Tesla a million EVs a year, and I think it's a pretty exciting story as they get ready to roll out a ton of different models. Right, Matt, but as we've been talking about all, all hour, I mean, the, the, we still have a number of consumers who are just racking, breaking up a, a ton of credit card debt, a ton of credit card debt, excuse me. So who are these consumers that are going to be buying these, especially when you consider uh, cars, Mercedes in particular, saw a 43% jump in prices. So uh, it'll be really interesting to see sort of how and, and if the consumer responds uh, to what Mercedes and, and also GM are, are saying. Yeah, it's a very good point. In fact, uh, David Welch, and Keith Naughton from our Detroit Bureau put out a story a couple days ago pointing out that the average consumer car payment right now is $770 a month. That's pretty punchy, especially when a lot of households need two uh, cars. So those prices just keep rising, and I can't imagine how consumers are keeping up with that kind of affordability or lack thereof. Coming up, the Munich Security Conference kicks off today with the war in Ukraine expected to dominate discussions. We're going to hear from Emmanuel Macron. We're going to hear from Olaf Scholz. We're going to hear from Maria Tadeo live in Munich next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Jennifer Zabasaja in London with Matt Miller in New York. Anna Edwards is off today. Now, here's a look at what's ahead today at 6.30 a.m. Eastern Time. The ECB's Francois Villeroy will comment on monetary policy and inflation in Paris. At 8.30 a.m., Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin will speak to reporters at an event in Virginia. And a short time later from that, we'll hear from Fed Governor Michelle Bowman speaking at a banking conference. And also today, the Munich Security Conference kicks off with the war in Ukraine taking center stage. Earlier today, we heard from Ukraine's deputy economy minister. Take a listen. The economy suffered a lot because uh, it's obvious that uh, the challenges we're facing are not coming without the uh, consequences. So eventually, we, we must admit that the economy shrunk for at least 30.5%, uh, 31% in GDP. We do anticipate uh, little growth uh, in, the, in the margin of like 2% at the end of the 2023. All right, Maria Tadeo is with us now out of Munich. She's at the security conference. That's a gig that I used to have, and I think it's an amazing conference to attend. So I hope you have a great couple of days, Maria. What's going on right now? Yes, uh, Matt, and what a year it has been. Remember, just uh, essentially the time, this time ago, a year ago, Volodymyr Zelensky was in this hotel uh, you see behind me telling the world that Ukraine did not want a war but was ready for it, and Russia, which denied until the very last second that it would invade the country. Now, you fast forward to this edition, and what you have is a war that's now almost in its first year of duration. You have a full-scale invasion and a lot of questions about the future. Now, the mood here, Matt, it really is to me one of uncertainty certainty what happens next is a question that I ask every official and obviously there's no clear answer to that when will the war end everyone will tell you a different story and then secondly there's also concerns about this idea of the new Russian invasion remember the head of NATO said you don't have to wait for the spring the offensive is in many ways underway now this morning we are going to hear from the French president Emmanuel Macron who just walked uh, behind us the, the, the motorcades that you see here belong to the French president at this point and the German chancellor who's also said to speak an important conversation for Germany remember the country has said it made mistakes when it comes to Russia and we'll have to learn from them. All right, Maria, thanks very much. Maria today at the Munich Security Conference, always a really important one this year, especially so. She's going to be speaking with the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak in a panel at the conference soon. This takes place on Saturday at 12 p.m. UK, 1 p.m. CET, and we'll have the highlights on Monday. This is Bloomberg.